Okay, so I feel like this iceberg was kind of like here most of the time. And now by the end, we're getting like all the way up here. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are finishing up the strange, weird, creepy, disturbing Wikipedia pages iceberg. Today we are doing tiers four, five, and six, which are the rest of the tiers on the iceberg. I'm just putting into one big video and we're going to do it. We're going to finish it today. All the trigger warnings for this video because researching it in itself, like things just got way darker than I even expected them to get and way darker compared to the other stuff in this iceberg. Like I feel like there's been some super creepy stuff in this iceberg, but like not extreme and we got, we're, whew, we're getting in there today. Since I know this video is going to get demonetized, we do kindly have a wonderful sponsor. So we're gonna roll to the ad read and then I will be right back with you. This video is sponsored by Merge Gardens. On my channel, you constantly hear super creepy stories that make you more or less just wanna go hide under the covers in your bedroom and just never come out. But today I'm gonna to tell you about the perfect place where you can escape from all of your problems and just relax. Welcome to Merge Gardens, a world where you can create your perfect garden and forget all the horror stories from real life. Merge Gardens is a fun, casual game where you build your own garden by filling it up with trees, plants, butterflies, birds, and ponds. There's also this mystery storyline in the game that you're trying to solve as you go along. And if you watch my channel, I am betting most of you can appreciate a good mystery. My favorite part about the game is just how relaxing it is. It gives my very chattering, chaotic brain a break when it needs one. But at the same time, the game is also still very stimulating and entertaining because there's these really cute puzzles to solve as well during the game. The rewards and the graphics are so satisfying and pleasant. There's also this organizational aspect to the game where you get to clean up a disheveled, messy garden and make it into something beautiful and crisp. Like for example, merge a field of dandelions into colorful flower arrangements. Like I said, it just makes my chaotic brain just so happy and calm. Get the free to play Merge Gardens today to dive into your very own private sanctuary on a beautiful garden estate. Download the game via my link in the description, which will be right below this video, or you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen right now with your device. Okay, getting down and dirty real quick with tier four. The first one in tier four is Albert Fish. So sorry. Albert Fish was a really fucked up man who did really, really fucked up things. I'm just going to put a list right here on the screen of all the things in like literally the first two lines of his Wikipedia page of everything that he is. He is obviously a serial killer who committed the worst of his crimes in the 1920s. He had a ton of nicknames like the Gray Man, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. Can we please stop giving bad people catchy and badass sounding nicknames? Anyway, we have no idea how many lives Albert truly took. Three children are definitely confirmed, but given just the way he was, I highly doubt those were his only victims. He was suspected of several others, but he bragged about committing a lot more. If you choose to go look at his wiki page yourself, I mean, just be prepared for like the worst things that humans are capable of. He really, really enjoyed pain and he enjoyed receiving it, but also inflicting it on others. He is most known for the murder of 10-year-old Grace Budd as he tricked Grace's family into letting him take Grace to a birthday party. He said he was going to his niece's birthday party and that he wanted to take Grace with him and his family allowed this, not knowing any better. This was a ruse, of course. Instead, he kidnapped Grace, he murdered her, and cannibalized her. He then wrote a letter to Grace's mother. It was a very extensive letter that went into very specific detail about what he did to her daughter. This letter in full is on the wiki page. And 
I'm here to tell you, as somebody who has read the letter, even if you're very desensitized, if you can read that letter and you don't get sick, then I think there might be something wrong with you because it's probably it's one of the most heinous things you'll ever read. Zero out of 10 recommend. I'm not going to read the letter in this video. It's very easy to find in other videos if you are curious, but it's so ridiculously graphic and it involves a very young child that it's just like, Nope, not touching that. Next is Hisashi Auchi. Hisashi was one of the victims of the 1999 Tokamura nuclear power plant accident in Japan. This poor man was only 35 years old when he died. And in this nuclear accident, he was exposed to more radiation than anybody in human history ever has. He had almost no white blood cell count and therefore he had no immune system. All of his skin quite literally melted off of his body and this man could only cry literal blood as tears and beg for his mother. Even though his body tried to shut down, it was so clear he was not supposed to be alive anymore. His body, I mean, he had heart attack after heart attack and kept flatlining, but his family was still holding out hope that there was some way to cure him. And so they had the doctors keep resuscitating him. They tried skin grafts on him. Those failed. They tried very new technology at the time, stem cell transplants. That did not work either. I think he like started to get a little better at first, but the radiation just basically like, whoop ate up the stem cells essentially. So they kept him alive in this pretty much dead, horrible state for a full 83 days in spite of the fact that he would ask them to let him go. It's thought that they wanted to use him because this was such a unique accident and his exposure was a unique case. They wanted to keep him alive to do experiments to see if anything would help radiation poisoning. And it was just cruel. Nobody should be kept alive at that stage. Nobody deserves that. Hi-Fi Murders is next. This was an event from 1974 in Ogden, Utah, where five people were very brutally tortured with three of these people losing their lives during a robbery at the Hi-Fi shop, which was a home audio store. There were six young men that went to the store on this day with the intention of robbing it. However, it is important to note that only two of them participated in the actual torture and killings of the victims. The rest of them either stayed in the getaway car or they were loading the trucks up with goods. Dale Selby Pierre was the main perpetrator and William Andrews was his close accomplice. These were the two men that were doing the actual violent stuff. They would both ultimately be executed by the state of Utah for their crimes. After going into the shop soon before they were closing, they started their robbery. The two men had already gone in planning on killing anybody that was in the store. However, they're like, perfect plan didn't really go the way they wanted it to and people were walking into the store family members of people that own the shop so there was five people that came in and some of them after the initial I think two that were in the shop which kind of like threw the perpetrators off guard they just kept holding them hostage they did torture them for a while but they ultimately tried to kill their victims by forcing them to drink Drano. They did it in this manner because they literally just saw a movie where somebody in the movie died from drinking Drano. And in the movie, it's depicted like they drank the Drano and just drop dead instantly. And so of course these idiots thought that that's how it happened in real life. So they're like forcing them to drink the Drano, but they can't drink enough because it's instantly causing blisters to their mouth and to their throat and they're coughing a bunch of it up. So while it was torture and it was horrible and painful for them, it wasn't going to kill them the way they thought in this silent, easy manner that they thought it was going to. So Instead, they just started shooting their victims execution style, aka the coward style, in the back 
of their heads. Sherry Michelle Ainsley, she was 18 years old. She arguably got the worst treatment because she was brutally by Pierre before being shot and killed. Byron Courtney Nesbitt was only 16 years old. He was shot in the back of his head, but he actually survived the attack. Byron's mother, 52-year-old Carol Nesbitt, she was also shot. She died shortly after being taken to the hospital. Oren William Walker, he was 43. He also survived. Pierre and Andrews tried to strangle him, but again, they probably thought that it was like in the movies where it was super easy and quick, but it's obviously it's not. And they failed to kill him that way. So they then proceeded to jam a ballpoint pen into his ear instead and like stomped on it to try to kill him that way. But of course, that also failed because again, they're idiots and don't know how anything works. They thought he was dead at one point, so they left. But Oren actually also was able to survive along with Byron Courtney. Oren, because of this, was actually able to even testify at the trial. So the last victim was Stanley Oren Walker, who was Oren's 20-year-old son. He was the third victim that was killed. He was also shot. Obviously, this case goes way more in depth than what I can fit in this video. It's an one of those, like, it could be a video on its own. And I mean, it's a pretty famous case. Other YouTubers have done videos on it if you want to know more about it. But it's, that's the gist. But yeah, it's um it's just like one of those, I think it baffles people because it's just so brutal. And for like, what? It, it just seemed so pointlessly brutal. Like they were just being brutal for the sake of it. It's really weird. Sylvia Likens is the next on our tier four. This is another one that I made a video about way back in the day, back when I was a baby YouTube channel. I honestly, it's possible I privated that video because it was so old and bad. So sorry about that. But this one's also been covered to death. Most of you probably know this one. But this true story is so famous that it's had two fictionalized movies made out of it. An American Crime from 2007 is based off of this story, as well as the other 2007 movie called The Girl Next Door. Sylvia Marie Likens was an American teenager who was just terribly tortured and ultimately murdered at the hands of her caregiver named Gertrude Banisquinsky. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. But Gertrude also like roped in her own children and some of the children's neighborhood friends to help her with torturing Sylvia. Sylvia was belittled. He, she was humiliated. She was sex. She was humiliated. They beat her. They starved her. They neglected her. They would burn her. I mean, everything that you could imagine. It gets way worse than that, but I'm not going into details for this video. The big debate about this, of course, is that like some of the the teenagers that Gertrude encouraged to help her were teenagers, but are they responsible, you know, or did Gertrude like, were they scared of Gertrude and didn't want them to put her focus on them so they complied with her to, you know, protect themselves. Sylvia ended up passing away on October 26th, 1965. At only the age of 16, she passed away from both malnourishment and from her extensive injuries. Gertrude was given life in prison, but she was paroled in 1985. She subsequently then died from lung cancer in 1990 at age 61. Hope it was painful. But of course, like all of these, the details. Whew. Junko Furuta. I do apologize if I'm also mispronouncing that. Many of you have likely heard of this case as well. I get a lot of requests to cover this case. It's very similar to Sylvia's case. Sylvia's took place in Indiana, USA though, and Junko Furuto was from Japan. Junko's abuse was primarily perpetrated by four teenage boys over 40 days from November 25th, 1988, all the way to January 4th, 1989. The things that they did to her, again, were just so unimaginably awful. It's just very hard to understand that there's people like this in the world. Basically, these four teenage boys severely 
sexually abused Junko. They tortured her and, of course, ultimately killed her. They did have the help of others. I think they would, like, take in other boys, too, but those were the four main perps. They ended up disposing her body in a barrel after she was dead and then filled it up with concrete. I do want to go further into details on this case someday. I think... I might have to pay wallet. <laughs> I might have to make it a Patreon only exclusive video because the $5 tiers over there get exclusive uncensored videos where I can go into all of the details and more extensive cases that are particularly brutal. I'm very sorry about that. Like I do hate to do that, but it's YouTube's game and we're just playing in it, you know? And I have to like heavily age restrict those and they're like privated and everything like that. So anyway, Patreon, if you do have the means and you want to see videos like that, my Patreon is always linked below my videos. Cult clan incest case. Before we get into this one, just know that every single name you're about to hear is a fake name. They're all pseudonyms to protect the privacy of specifically the children in this family. This is an Australian family that in 2012 was discovered to have been made up of at least four generations of pure incest. The original couple of the clan was Tim and June Colts. They are from uh, around New South Wales in Australia. June herself was the daughter, the product of a brother-sister couple. Then her and Tim, who I don't believe are related, but I'm not positive. They have a bunch of children. And then Tim started being their daughter, Betty, when she was only 12 years old. This whole family lives on a compound together, like very isolated from the rest of the world. So the poor children don't know any better. June ends up dying in 2001 and Tim dies in 2009. And so Betty, the 12-year-old we were just talking about, but of course, who's older now, she becomes like the leader of the clan and she continues this incest train. Betty also would rape her sons and she has children with her sons, but her and her brother are the main like couple and they have 12 children together. There's almost 40 members. I think there's 38 right now living on this little farm. It's very weird because it doesn't look like they are impoverished. Like they have toys for Christmas. They, they have like this exclusive photo shoot that they took of the farm and it shows like that they have all this stuff to live off of. They have Christmas presents for the children. They have cute dresses. They don't seem to be like very badly off. But in spite of that, they don't have showers, they don't have running waters, they don't have toilets or like any hygienic stuff whatsoever. So it's just, it's so bizarre. And like I said, we don't know that much about them because for the children's sake, we've kept them pretty uh, out of the public eye. Then of course, many of the children suffer from uh, defects as that's why incest is bad to begin with, is that you're mixing genes up too close. And I just feel so bad for the kids there because it's a very messy situation, but it sounds very much to me like the children were just born into it and they have no idea what the outside world is or what conventional society is. So they're just doing what they were taught. Like what else are they supposed to do? After being discovered, many of the children were thankfully put into foster care. I would have to look way more into it to see what they're all actually doing today. This case is so fascinating and I have never heard of it before. So coin operated locker babies. This is something else I had never heard of before, but it's mostly prevalent in Japan and unfortunately still happens sometimes today. It's an abandonment method for babies. Many, many, like usually newborn babies have been abandoned like this. They are sometimes stillborn, so they're already dead, but sometimes they're not. And they are literally put into coin-operated lockers. Some of the people that do this believe that the lockers are checked frequently, so they 
don't have the intention of killing their child, but they're just trying to abandon the child with the hopes that somebody will find them quickly and put them into foster care or a misconception that they can breathe inside of the lockers when they can't. But very frequently, the child will end up passing away. Of course, this happens the most to minority groups, as well as impoverished groups, as well as people with a lack of access to birth control. Surprise. And I don't know why, but I guess they don't have that thing in Japan where you can just like drop a newborn at a fire station or a hospital and then run away. I know in the US, that's a thing where parents, of course, I mean, it's still illegal, but Parents will, if they want to abandon their baby, they'll drop them off at like a hospital and, you know, conceal their identity and then get away before anybody sees them. But that way they're cared for very quickly and somebody can take them in very quickly, whereas putting them in a locker is just dangerous. So I don't get it specifically why they're abandoned in lockers. Maybe they just don't have that system in Japan or the punishment is much worse if you're caught. I don't know. Either way, it's so sad. North Korean prison camps. As most of us know, North Korea is a country that is controlled by a dictatorship. As a result, many of the people there are oppressed and abused. It's like, to me, it's like the world's biggest cults. That's an opinion though, not a fact. So in North Korea, there are prison camps, which are pretty much concentration camps. There are camps specifically for political criminals, but there are other camps, of course, just for general crimes. The guards of these camps are reportedly trained specifically to treat the prisoners as if they are subhuman. This is on the iceberg because there are details on this wiki page about things that allegedly happen to the prisoners in those camps and they are scary. Not surprising, but extremely frightening and just very disturbing. Let's just say if you were condemned to one of those camps, if you didn't die from malnutrition or starvation, you'd likely die or become severely injured from being either neglected, tortured, or simply overworked through slave labor. Ibadan, Forest of Horror. So on May 22nd, 2014 in Ibadan, Nigeria, a group of motorcycle taxi drivers went out to search for a fellow driver who was missing in the area. They went into the forest to search for him and they came across a very rundown building in the middle of the woods. What they found inside of this building was definitely not the missing driver, but rather a scene right out of a horror movie. The building was being used by a group for both human trafficking and ritualistic human sacrifice. They found 23 people in the building that were still alive and they were able to rescue, but they also found just tons of decomposing body parts, decomposing whole bodies, and objects of other victims who were no longer with us. Absolutely horrific. Literally straight out of a horror movie. Boy in the Box. Yay. So many of you guys have probably heard of this case. And this one's actually really awesome. There's actually some really good news on this one for once because even though this iceberg was probably written before it was solved. Actually, I'm pretty positive that it was. Just in December of 2022, like just a few months ago, this case was like miraculously solved over 65 years later. Amazing. So Boy in the Box is one of those like very famous true crime stories that really sticks with us because like I said, it's been a mystery up until December of 2022. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in February 1957, a four-year-old boy's body was found both naked and severely beaten in a literal box. It was also clear that he was very malnourished, but oddly, he was like very well-groomed. He recently had had a haircut and his nails had been trimmed. He was just overall clean, like he had just had a bath too. They've had to exhume his remains several times for further DNA testing. And with the help of like the gene database, that we've been doing, 
they found a DNA match for him. His name was Joseph Augustus Zarelli. Now, this case is solved, but it's certainly not over. I think they are looking into the parents and still trying to figure out exactly what happened to him. Cave of Dogs. Cave of Dogs is a cave. It's located in Naples, Italy. If you go inside the cave, you'll find that volcanic gases make it full of carbon dioxide. So that's fun. But it's called the Cave of Dogs because they found that if you brought dogs or other small mammals into the cave, they would pass out from carbon dioxide poisoning. The reason they did is because they were lower to the ground where the carbon dioxide was more dense and they found that the humans did not because the humans were all standing and they were higher up. So naturally, it became a tourist attraction in the 1800s. Now, this is super sad. This one is going to involve like cruelty to animals, but it was a couple hundred years ago, so it doesn't bother me quite as much. But for a fee, the local guides in the area for tourists would purposely suspend a dog in the cave so that they could watch the dog pass out just for people's amusement. They would revive the dogs in the water. They didn't do it until the dogs passed or anything like that. But still, It was terrible. Even some people back then recognized that it was very cruel. Sasebo slashing, also probably mispronouncing that one. This one, I mean, if I'm not already demonetized for this video, I sure am now. This was the murder of a 12 year old girl named Satomi Matare at the hands of another girl at her school who was only 11 years old. The 11 year old perpetrator has never been identified because she was so young when she committed the crime. But on June 1st, 2004, the two girls in their elementary school were left in a classroom together alone. The 11-year-old girl used a box cutter to kill 12-year-old Satomi, slashing both her arms and then her throat. She did finally later tell the police that she got mad at Satomi because they got in a fight and Satomi made fun of her weight and called her a quote unquote goody goody, both of these things happening online. This 11 year old girl was subsequently institutionalized for this crime. Murder of James Bulger. Yeah, let's just keep doing the kids killing other kids stuff. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this particular one as I've talked about it before. And again, it just involves all children. It's just like the most devastating thing ever. Many of you have probably heard of this one as well. Little James Bulger was a two-year-old boy. He was abducted by two 10-year-old boys at a shopping mall. They led him off and they tortured him and killed him, did things that shocked people as it was perplexing that boys so young, only 10 years old, would know the things that they were doing to James. The whole case is just, I mean, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be just so bizarre for how young everybody involved was. Ling Chi. This is the kind of thing that will make you cringe and set your teeth on edge. Like, um, will make you lightheaded. Well, probably won't make everybody lightheaded, but some people it'll make lightheaded like me. This is another torture execution method that happened in China for centuries. It was most prevalent in China, but it did also occur in Vietnam and Korea. This was a method for executing you if you committed a particularly heinous crime not violence, but something like treason. They would tie you to a wooden frame in public first to humiliate you. Then they would cut you with a knife and then they would cut you with a knife again. And then they would start slowly cutting pieces of your body off and then do it until you die again in public. Thalidomide scandal. Thalidomide was a drug that was made in the 1950s. It has many uses, but one of the uses that it was advertised for in the 50s was to help people with anxiety, trouble sleeping, tension, and morning sickness. It was prescribed to a bunch of pregnant women and also to women who then soon became pregnant, even though they never tested it on pregnant women before to see if it was safe. It was definitely not safe because the scandal was that this drug being prescribed to so many pregnant women 
caused about 10,000 babies to be formed with a range of birth defects, but many of these defects being pretty severe. It also led, of course, to just many, many miscarriages. Yuba County 5. This is another case that could be a one-hour video on its own. Nexpo made a really good video about this case a while back that I watched when it came out. Highly recommend if you are curious about this case after listening to the summary. This was a very mysterious case of five men, all in their 20s and 30s, All of them had some sort of neurodiversity, either a mental disability or a psychiatric disorder. On February 24th, 1978, the five of them attended a basketball game in Chico, California at a university. Four out of five of them were later found dead months later in June of 1978. And the last man was never found. To this day, we don't definitively know what happened to them that night. Hinterkaifeck murders. This is one of those cases for me. I mean, it just has everything. It's vintage. It's axe murders. It's happened at a farmhouse. And it's still unsolved over a hundred years later. This was the murder of six people in March of 1922 in a small farmstead that was located about 43 miles north of Munich, Germany. Five of the victims belonged to the Gruber family. The sixth victim was their maid. It's believed that the perpetrator or perpetrators lived with the victim's bodies after killing them for three days before they finally fled. Okay, technically they were all killed with a mattock and not an ax, but the two things are pretty similar. Even creepier, in the months leading up to the murders, strange things were happening on the farmstead. The Gruber's previous maid actually quit because she was hearing weird noises coming from the attic and she was convinced that the house was haunted. Of course, some people believe, therefore, that this was some sort of paranormal crime act of violence, but it leads me and many others to be convinced that the perpetrator was living among them upstairs and hiding in their attic and watching them for the months leading up to this happening. There is a ton of theories and suspects in this case. I honestly, I would love to deep dive this one of these days because this is just, like I said, one of those cases for me that just stick with me that I really, really fascinates me as tragic as it was. But I know this type of video wouldn't do very well on my channel. I know you guys, I know what does well and what won't and cases like that is not going to get that many views, but maybe I'll do it anyway, just for my own sake. Okay, that was tier four. Let's move on to tier five. The first one in tier five is fetal abduction. This is literally what it sounds like. You know, it's those rare horror stories you hear when a woman befriends another pregnant woman, gains her trust, and then when she's almost full term, kidnaps the woman, holds her hostage, and then forces a C-section on her so that she could steal her baby. Even creepier, very often the perpetrator will pretend to be pregnant themselves. And then when it's time, when they would be full term, they then abduct someone else's fetus so that people don't ask questions. Some even go as far to steal the baby, bring it to the hospital after having cut their own genitals in a way that would indicate that they tore during childbirth down there. There's only like 302 ever total cases documented worldwide though. So to be fair, this kind of occurrence is relatively rare. The wiki page has a nice complete list describing a lot of the incidents that have happened over the years though. For example, this one just happened in 2020. 21-year-old Regan Simmons Hancock, who was eight months pregnant, was killed on October 9th in New Boston, Texas. Her baby was cut from her body. Taylor Parker, who claimed to only know Hancock by her first name, had been the photographer at Hancock's wedding the year before and had spent time with Hancock the week of the murder, going out for a quote-unquote girls' day and visited Hancock and her husband's home the night before, telling them she was to be induced the following day, the day the murders occurred. Parker was later arrested in Oklahoma in connection with the case. She was convicted of Hancock's murder in October of 2022. She was sentenced to death 
in November 2022. Unit 731 is next. This is another one we've talked about in the Do Not Research iceberg, and I also get a lot of requests to talk about. This was a heinous experiment slash research project that took place in Japan during World War II. The Surgeon General and Director of the unit, Shiro Ishii, along with his staff, made concoctions of pathogens, including anthrax, bubonic plague, smallpox, botulism, among other things. They then forced the prisoners to consume, inhale, or be injected with these concoctions just to see what would happen. The Japanese army were supplied with biological warfare from Unit 731 and contaminated enemy water supplies. They released infected fleas or dropped infected wheat from airplanes. Ishii tried to fake his own death and then went into hiding in 1945, but that didn't work when America came after him. He ended up getting full immunity for his crimes because he was willing to exchange the results that he got from all of his disgusting experiments. So the United States accepted the results of his experiments in exchange for letting him get off scot-free. The research, of course, wasn't even helpful in the end. And Ishii died a completely free man later at the age of 67. Kelly Ann Bates is next on tier five. This one is just as bad as Sylvia and Junko's cases, except I don't know how I've never heard of this one. Probably the worst case of DV that I have heard of in all of my years of researching true crime, which is saying a lot because a lot of true crime involves DV. This one is from Manchester, England. Kelly Ann Bates was groomed by a man starting when she was only 14 years old, and he was 30 years her senior. He was in his 40s. At 17 years old, he manipulated her into moving in with him and they became boyfriend, girlfriend, and I don't use that term seriously because obviously she was a victim. They were not in a consensual relationship. There were very big warning signs that DV was happening in their household, but unfortunately her family could not help Kelly as she, of course, you know, denied it as many victims do. And Kelly was not able to escape before James Patterson Smith, the man who groomed her from a young age, uh, killed her. The injuries that they found on Kelly's body by the pathologist, they were so bad that the pathologist who said that he had seen over 600 cases of homicide said that Kelly had the most extensive injuries he had ever seen in his line of work. And then to top it off, at trial, James, of course, pleaded not guilty. And at trial, he blamed everything on Kelly. He blamed it all on her. Every little thing that happened was something because she provoked him or what have you. He is in prison, but he is still alive to this day. She was ultimately drowned in the bathtub, but not before being just, I mean, something involves her eyes before she died. Like just the absolute worst torture and needless pain that she had to go through before he took her life. Just, oh, this is another one that I will probably make for my Patreon one day because it's a case that is fascinating to me, but I just, I can't put it on the main channel. I can't. Locked in syndrome is next. Locked in syndrome is probably the most terrifying medical disorder that I have certainly ever heard of. We just talked about it in Lacey's case a few weeks ago when we talked about her terrible case and if she had it or not. It is also referred to as a pseudocoma. It's this disorder where the patient loses all ability to move, to speak. They literally are completely paralyzed except for their eyes, which can blink or move vertically. It's pretty much everybody's worst nightmare because not only are you a vegetable, but you're completely aware of the fact that you're a vegetable. Anybody can technically be a victim of this syndrome because it can result from having a severe injury, having a brainstem stroke, 
Some people even get it from certain types of poisonings. Tsutomu Miyazaki. A lot of incidents from Japan in these deep tiers. I swear, I didn't make this iceberg, so. Tsutomu Miyazaki was a serial killer. He killed four children between 1988 and 1989. All of his victims were aged four to seven. Very, very young girls. He can't his victims afterwards. He them after death a lot and just a lot more super f***ed up shit. He was found guilty and he was executed by hanging on June 17, 2008 in Japan. Crush fetish. I'm not going to get into this one too much and I'm not sorry about it. Trust me. Lightly, it's a fetish where people like to see things being crushed, such as watching random objects being crushed or like fruit or other foods being crushed. But this one gets way darker than that. And when I first learned about this concept, it was several years ago and it ruined my life for like two weeks. Like I could not sleep and it was all I could think about. And every time I got reminded of it, I just, it ruined my life. I wish I had never heard of this. So I just highly recommend not looking into this one unless you already know what it is. I know, I know a lot of you are morbidly curious and a lot of the times when I say something is so terrible, it makes you want to go look it up anyway. And I know for a lot of the topics, you're welcome to go do that because I feel like you know what you're getting into. But seriously, resist your morbid curiosity on this one. It's not interesting. It's not surprising. It doesn't fulfill any morbid curiosity Trust me, just don't. Just take my word on this one that it's just like not, it's not worth knowing. It, nobody needs, it, there's just information that some of us never need to know. And this is it. And like I said, it's not interesting at all. Okay, Suzanne Capper. This is another true crime case from 1992 in Manchester, England. Suzanne was also the victim of torture for days by six assailants before being ultimately set on fire. She actually survived this attack initially and she was able to get help. She was even able to name her six assailants in the hospital before she went into a coma and passed away. Her attackers did this to her for three very stupid reasons, which are clearly excuses. All these things they claim Suzanne did to antagonize them are alleged. We're not even positive that she did these things. Even if she did, doesn't mean she deserved to get killed over them. Like, good grief. But A, she supposedly made a comment to one of the female assailants that she should go sleep with the man for money. B, she stole one of the assailants' pink duffel coat. And C, some of them think that she gave them lice. So stupid. Kermit Gosnell is next. Kermit was running an illegal abortion clinic in the mid-2000s in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was technically a doctor, but he really shouldn't have been. Of course, he was providing these abortions to mostly immigrant women who probably had a harder time getting them in the normal places, as well as, of course, impoverished people. And most all of his patients were people of color. He was so sought after because he was willing to perform late stage abortions, but he was performing these procedures in very unsanitary conditions. Like he was doing super shady stuff. He was over prescribing Oxycontin. He was not following sanitary practices, just all the shady stuff and just a lot of malpractice in general. But even worse, he killed at least three babies after inducing labor to do the abortion, but the babies were born alive and he killed them anyway, even though they were born alive. So he got nailed for three counts of murder for that. At least one woman died in his care during a procedure and he could have prevented it, but he didn't. So he got a manslaughter charge for that one. And then he was charged with 21 counts of performing very late stage abortions. He then got slammed with 211 counts of violating the 24 hour informed consent laws. So that's fun. Next is list of incidents of cannibalism. Another one that is exactly 
as it sounds. There is a wiki page dedicated to just a list of all the cannibalism incidents over the last few centuries. It goes all the way into prehistoric cases, the Middle Ages, and then like the 16th and 19th centuries, all the way up to modern day. The one in 2022, the most recent case on the list is from India, where people were found performing human sacrifice and engaging in cannibalism there. Or there was another case in 2012, where three men in Japan were convicted of killing and eating their mutual friend in 2009. As you can imagine, for most people, diving into this wiki page and looking at more of these cases in detail is very likely to make you nauseous, if not at least a little queasy reading about it. Okay, let's get into the last final darkest tier, which is tier six. This one, we're almost done, you guys. This one is shorter. Mr. Cruel is next. This one is out of Melbourne, Victoria in Australia, and it is from the late 80s to early 90s. Mr. Cruel is especially creepy because he's never been identified to this day. He was also just very meticulous and incredibly smart about his crimes. He always wore a balaclava to hide his identity, and he never left any forensic evidence behind. His three main attacks involved him going into the homes of families with young daughters. He would tie up the whole family and then either rape or abuse the daughter that was always 10 to 13 years old. But in all three cases, he actually never killed any of the girls. All the girls were released after he was done attacking. He probably didn't intend to kill them as that's why he hid his identity. In 1991, a 13-year-old girl named Carmine Chan was abducted by a man in a balaclava and she was subsequently killed by him. It is suspected to be the work of Mr. Cruel, but we don't know for sure. There's just not enough evidence to link them for sure. And then, of course, like many of these cases, it's very likely that he committed many more crimes that we aren't aware of. Like I said, nobody knows what happened to him or what became of him. He still has never been identified to this day. I would bet my money on the fact that he must have died in the early 90s because usually people like that don't um, stop at releasing their victims. Usually they escalate and become serial killers. Obviously, we don't know, but I would bet my money that something happened and somehow the perpetrator of these crimes just happened to die and that's why they stopped. Cruel Onion Wiki is next. This is under the broader Wikipedia page entitled the list of Tor Onion services. Tor, as most of us know, is the network where people go to get into the dark web because it's supposedly anonymous. Within these lists on this wiki page, there's things like lists of commerce sites, email providers, whistleblowing, drop sites, it's just like what is within the dark web, basically. But there's also a section for pornography sites on tour. Thankfully, all of them have been deleted. None of these exist anymore on tour except for Pornhub, but you can find Pornhub on the surface net. So you don't have to go on tour for that anyway, because that one's legal. But of course, all the others, as you can imagine, they wouldn't have to be on tour unless they were illegal. See where I'm going with this? So all the names of these sites are really gross. Uh, for example, one of them is called Lolita City. We'll just leave it at that. Hurtcore. Hurtcore is a great segue from what we were just talking about. This is a form of CP, except instead of regular CP, it's violent. So somehow the absolute worst things that humans already do, they can just somehow make it even worse. <laughs> like zoo sadism is next. Again, do I even need to explain this to you guys? Like most of you are going to understand what this is just by the title. But let's talk about the McDonald triad for a second, because this is one third of the McDonald triad. That's an interesting concept that I love talking about. The McDonald triad is a set of three behaviors that are seen in people who turn out to be psychopaths. Only two of the three behaviors need to be present in order to predict their later violent tendencies. The three factors are in childhood, persistent bedwetting past the age of five, obsession with starting fires, and cruelty to animals. However, these behaviors certainly could simply be a behavior reaction to childhood abuse and neglect. 
These could just be things that children are doing to cope with their home life. And the people that are abused in childhood or severely neglected are sometimes more prone to becoming violent later in life. So it's a correlation causation conundrum. We don't know if they're doing those acts because of their environment or if they're doing those acts because it's a precursor to something sinister. Anyway, zoo sadism is the one that is most commonly talked about. That's the notorious one that we think of serial killers very often in their young adulthood or childhood teenage years show cruelty towards animals and they enjoy it. It's possible that that's showing in early signs of psychopath. We have no definitive link. We don't know for sure. However, I would (laughs) encourage people if their children are exhibiting signs like that, it's definitely a red flag. It's definitely a red flag. I'll just say that. Consult professionals. The Nanjing Massacre, the last Japan stuff on this list, thankfully, but this is one of the worst massacres that happened during World War II. It was an attack on the city of Nanjing in China by the Imperial Japanese Army. It was six full weeks. It involved mass rape, looting, and arson, as well as just killing all the civilians. It's estimated that 200,000 people were killed during this massacre, but the estimates vary. Some say that it was as low as 40,000 people. Other experts say it was as high as 300,000 people. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. It was still a massacre. It was still a shit ton of people that lost their lives. <laughs> it doesn't get better, you guys. It doesn't get better. Lynching postcard is next. This is something that I'm embarrassed to say horrified me to learn about, but then quickly realized that I should not be surprised at all that this was a thing, giving America's very racist past and present, let's be honest. We all know what lynching is, right? It's the murder of someone by civilians, and the civilians believe that it's an act of vigilantism, but it's almost always killing somebody because of their race. Lynching postcards was a widespread thing for over 50 years in the United States, mostly in the late 1800s until the first ban in 1908. They were actual postcards with lynching victims, pictures of them after being lynched on the postcard. They would then, to boot, often have racist text and racist poems written on them. They were subsequently collected by people, distributed by others, and kept by some as souvenirs. This may seem like a long time ago, but if you think about it, it's really not. And the U.S. Postal Service banned it in 1908, but that did not stop people from distributing these. They still just then used envelopes and other wrapping so that the USPS didn't know what was going through the mail. So it was like still happening after 1908. Three Guys, One Hammer, Thankfully, we've talked about this one so much. Unless this is your first video of mine on my channel, you have probably heard me talk about this one. I've talked about it so many times. It's on almost every disturbing iceberg ever. And we just talked about it in the Run the Gauntlet video from a couple weeks ago. But it is a shock gore video. It's two guys in Ukraine that would senselessly go around their neighborhood and the area in Ukraine where they lived, and they would kill people violently and often record it. And I think the thing that is most shocking and the sickest to most people is that it just, they just did it for fun. They actually thought that it was a fun hobby pastime. They would laugh while they were doing it. They saw absolutely no remorse no reason, completely random victims that did nothing to provoke them. Very, very bizarre. So Three Guys, One Hammer is really known as their worst video. It was them recording the entire torture and murder of the victim, a man named Sergei Yadzenko. They filmed it in the woods and the video then got leaked online. It's often featured on shock sites to this day. It's often a like challenge to see if you can make it through the whole video, which is just, I have such like mixed feelings about gore videos because I know that it like shock websites are a thing. But all I can think about is Sergey's family and him 
being on websites in his terrible final moments. And it's like, I don't know. I just sound like I'm on a soapbox. So I don't want to sound like morally superior or anything because I'm not really much better. I have that morbid curiosity for sure. And I've seen a lot of gore videos, but just like, I mean, let's just all remember, like that was a fucking person. Like it was a person that was a whole ass person just like you. So Anyway, okay, off my soapbox. All right, guys, that's gonna be it. We did it. We're done with the wiki iceberg. I think I'm gonna take a break from icebergs for a while and do some other topics as much as I love them, but I think I need a break from them. And yeah, please like the video just to help the channel out, even though this video was absolutely horrendous with the topics given. Don't forget Merge Gardens, which would be our sponsor today. You're supporting me, supporting the channel by supporting the sponsors, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. Top tiers are Colin Holmes, The Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Bambi, Momo Neon, Philip J, Marita144, Sage K, Elderly Hipster, Reese Rolls, The Puppy Hag, Rebecca Jackson, Toby, Carter, Kawakan Anime and Gaming Convention, Sonder, Sarah the Crazy Fish Lady, Blood for the Koi, Larkrar, Maxi, Ashley Danielle, Ellison Luna, Julieta, Cece Picard, Sophia Wood, A Bunny Apparently, Leon Vanek, Destiny Riley, Literally Lacey, Elliot Fink, I Am In Your Walls, Habromania, Cyberdog Investigations, LLC, and our newest, Vicky Cat, Amy B, 